Welcome, welcome to Q and A with Tonya Carlson and Emerson Moe and Melissa's here tonight to cause division any way she can. <laughs> and we've got some good questions too. Are you ready for a question? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm a little froggy tonight. This is from Sashin Debodia. Why was it necessary for Mary to be immaculately conceived? Try that one. Jackson, you go first. All right. Well, my way I understand it is that in order for Jesus of the Catholic Church to be clean, to be perfect, to be sinless, he had to come from a sinless body. So in the uh, um, Gospel of James, there is a story about Mary being sinless and that even after she had the child Jesus, the midwife came in and looked in there and said, that, oh, she's still a virgin. So that's a dogma. I think it came in through a, a Pope's decree in 1951 concerning the Immaculate Conception. That's not of Jesus. That is of Mary. So the way they understood it, for Jesus to be immaculate, Mary had to be immaculate. And I guess for Mary to be immaculate, Anna, or Catherine, whichever one of those is his mother, her mother had to be immaculate, right? That has to do with uh, sexuality. You know, it's, a, it's a sin to have intercourse with your wife at that time, uh, supposedly. So I think that the Catholics just put that in there to make everything work out a little better for them. What do you think, Oni? Yeah, so um, the Immaculate Conception Doctrine concludes that if Mary had a sin nature, she would have passed it on to the Messiah, and then the Messiah would have been born of a sin nature. So he, he couldn't have been born of a sin nature. Therefore, Mary must not have had a sin nature. Um, and... Uh, uh, the Gnostics believed that sex, particularly the lust of sex, passes on through the seed of the man, it passes on the sin nature. Mm -hmm. um, Augustine was a big proponent of this, and Augustine was an ex uh, Manichaean, however you say it, Manichaean. Manichaean. Uh, and he converted to Christianity, but he borrowed, he, he kept some of the baggage of his Gnosticism. Mm -hmm. And a lot of other Christians fell prey to Gnostic ideas that crept into the church. You know, the New Testament writers warned about Gnostic ideas invading the church. <clears throat> I think Augustine had a, a mistress all his life too, at least one. That was one of his weaknesses that he couldn't overcome. I'm not sure about what happened, what he did after he converted, but I, I do know that he struggled with sexual sin uh, uh, before he converted and after he converted. I know he struggled with lust. <clears throat> I'm really glad I don't struggle with that one. Um, you, you struggle with uh, lust for power. Yeah, that's it. And you're greedy. Thinking, you're greedy too, but um I was thinking of the church of the <laughs> immaculate deception and the guiding light. Um but let me just say one other thing. Uh I actually believe in the immaculate conception of all people throughout the entire history of humanity. Immaculate conception in the sense that you are born without a sin nature. I one hundred percent believe that I don't believe in a sin nature at all. Uh from what I see according to scripture there's very weak evidence of a sin nature. And when I say sin nature, I mean born 
with a nature that inevitably will sin. I believe, based on scripture as well as common sense and more moral ethical principles and philosophical principles that uh, that you cannot be such a state where you are, where it's inevitable that you will sin because if it if it was inevitable for you to sin then you would be forced into sin it wouldn't be your fault anymore because you were created by your creator in such a way that you had to sin because that's how you were how your body was programmed because uh, if you have a sin nature that makes it so that you can't be sinless then who is at fault that you are not sinless your creator is at fault because he created without the ability to be sinless that means like even one of the lesser commandments like keeping the sabbath to be sinless. well the sabbath is i wouldn't classify as a lesser commandment necessarily okay i well i'm just saying one that no i mean one that people don't let's, let's say eating pork yeah, but uh, look, that means that child would have to keep the Sabbath his entire life to keep, because sin is transgression of the Torah. That's the definition of it. So I, I don't see anything wrong with your theory there, except I'm thinking of hereditary addictions and propensities, uh, uh, sociopathic personality disorder, um, Mental illnesses like psychosis runs in, in families, um, split personality runs in families, supposedly. What about those things? Would they give you a propensity to sin? Uh, so, um, so I do want to say that I believe in distinction between sin. Like in ancient times, the definition for sin has changed from what the current definition is. So we, we view sin today as something immoral in such a way that you are uh, essentially evil or um, condemned spiritually and you need, you need forgiveness, otherwise you'll be condemned. That, that's the way we view sin uh, today, typically, in yeah. the church. In ancient times, sin was a broader category. Sin basically meant error or wrong, something that was wrong or erroneous. Now, if you, if you take a test and you get some answers wrong, that's not, that's not bad. Like that, that's not sinful in the sense of no. we use today, but it was sinful in the sense they used it in the ancient times where it was wrong. It was incorrect. It was, it was a bad answer, but it wasn't a morally bad thing. So that's an important distinction to make. So in, in regards to things like children not keeping the Sabbath, children not doing certain things, if they're not accountable because they're kids, they're not accountable to certain things, I believe. So that even if they do certain sins, it's sin in that definition of they did something wrong, but they didn't do something immoral because they didn't have the ability to know it was wrong. There, there are certain requirements that you need to know something uh, to, to be able to know it's wrong uh, in order for you to be morally at fault. Um, so when I say I don't believe in a sin nature, I simply mean I don't believe that we were created so that we inevitably will be at fault morally oh, in yeah. our life. Yes, yes. In fact, Catholic teaching has gone over to that idea. At the seminary, I remember the first thing that they, they said, they said, it, it goes around that you're born in sin, but we as Catholics, we believe that every birth is good and doesn't inevitably lead to sin. But the church that I work in, there's three very bad sins that the preacher talks about almost constantly. One is the drinking of Bud Light. <laughs> the second is smoking cigarette or a pipe or a cigar. And the third one uh, is 
falling asleep when the minister's speaking. In fact, I fell asleep one time. The preacher woke me up from the pulpit saying, that might be the last sin you commit before you end up in hell. <laughs> so it, those things aren't sins. It depends who you they, ask, right? Yeah, that, they, that has nothing to do with what sin is. You know, it might be something about having to do with discipline or some mores of a church or a community of some kind, but they're not sins. Sin is a transgression of the Torah. And I don't think you can sin. Well, you can't sin unless you know the Torah. That's why I think, you know, these people are so immoral every place. They're going to be judged terribly. Well, why should they be judged? They're not under Torah. They don't know anything about Torah. They're good law-abiding people, but they wouldn't think there are any time to keep the Sabbath or go to a feast or any other thing. They don't have Torah. I think this is what Paul teaches until it's introduced to them. Paul says, uh, I didn't know what sin was until I looked into the Torah. Yet the Torah is like Sodom in Egypt when it comes to the true spiritual life. Uh, I was talking to uh, a pretty famous minister this week about uh, preterism. And I said, one thing I, I don't like about preterism, does it entail the thought that Israel has lost out on any promises? And he said, yes, exactly right. That's what happened in 70 AD. God made the choice finally to destroy Israel and turn all the promises of Scripture over to Christians. I said, to Christians? Just to Christians? He said, those that are in the church. Because after that, the church becomes the mouthpiece for Messiah. Whatever the church says is right and true. Whatever pronouncement is made is the mouth of Christ. I was thinking that's so much different than what we believe when we're trying to go back to the uh, primitive teachings of Messiah, try to recapture those things. Uh, we can't say that, especially looking at history, like they can boast that the church holds the oracles of God. You have a comment on that one? Um, well, I, I think that I believe it's the institution of the church, but I think that the church has been watered down. And um, I don't believe in that the church has replaced Israel but I believe that there's a dual covenant. I'm basically a proponent of dual covenant theology where I believe in that the old covenant is still binding and in force to this day and the new covenant as well. And that the old covenant is for Israel only. The new covenant is for Israel and the church, or in other words, it's for the church. Um, and all people are called to join the church, Israel and Gentiles. But once you enter the church, then you are under the new covenant. But for Israelites, when they join the church, they're already under the old covenant. They don't have to, they're not allowed to stop following the old covenant simply because they join the church. They now have to keep both covenants because a covenant doesn't just go away. It, it remains in force. So the covenant was made specifically with Israel as a nation as a people. So his people, Israel, still must stay faithful to the Old Covenant. Even if they become believers of the Messiah and join the church, and if they join the church, that means they enter the New Covenant, but they cannot betray the Old Covenant. If they do, then they are basically apostates of their faith. If, well, how about, I, I if, how about if you attach yourself to Israel? Right? Like, you know, I don't have any Israel blood that I know of. 
But uh, I attached myself as part of the promise to the mixed multitude in Exodus 33, I think, that um, I have just as much right to the blessings of, of Israel as any Israelite does, because I have decided to come in to Israel. And to come into Israel primarily means to keep the laws of the nation of Israel and evidently the kingdom of God too. So what about that? I mean, what, what covenant, what is the new covenant exactly? We, you know, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's a new covenant in the land of Damascus. What ex I believe that the Dead Sea Scrolls new covenant and the, the Jewish Christian new covenant are the same thing. So uh, how about that? So first, I want to say that I believe that um, that uh, in order to become a part of Israel, to become a part of the Old Covenant, um, I don't think it's enough to identify with Israel. A lot of people identify no, with Israel. No, I don't think that's enough. Um, Here's the thing. Uh, scripture is very strong about community and, a, and, a, and an actual physical people. That, that's, uh, that's the Sherry, I think, uh, who was called in. Uh, I'm not seeing that, her. That, that's the, my, the number, I think. Uh, Hello. Sing that song again. Hello. Sherry, oh, yeah. Sherry, baby. I sang it That's very respectfully. It's my old friend, Jerry Abril. Yep. Uh, Emerson, Emerson was just saying uh, that um, I, I think the best way to approach it is um, when when someone I, I think except with the exception of me and Jackson, uh, if if someone wants to talk. Then they unmute themselves and talk, and they can talk. But if, if they uh, are not saying anything, then they should be muted until they have something to say. Um, because there's a little bit of feedback from your phone, Sherry. So is there a um, way? To yeah. How do I mute it? Um. Is it I'm not sure how, how you do it from your phone, uh, Jackson. Okay, that that worked. Um. So if you have something to say, oh, I guess since it's from the phone, you probably can't type. Um, but if you have something to say, you can unmute yourself and uh, you can ask a question or say a statement. Um, but basically, so from what I could see is that in the, the movement of believers of today, we, we see a tendency to embrace the old covenant and the Hebrew roots, and I think that's a good thing, but I think it gets carried away and distorted. And one of the things I see that I think is wrong is people believe that if they simply believe in the Torah and want to follow the Torah, that that makes them a part of the covenant of the old covenant and they become an Israelite simply because they want to be an Israelite. But I believe it's more physically based. I believe that it's very much a, na a national covenant. It's a covenant with a nation, the nation of Israel, mm. the, pe the people. And so I believe that uh, you have to actually physically join a community of Israelites uh, in order to become Israel. And not only that, according to the Temple Scroll, and Deuteronomy supports this, I think Exodus as well supports this. Basically, there's three generations after you until they become fully Israel. So let's say you wanna, you're a Gentile, you want to become an Israelite. Unfortunately, under the law, you don't get the full rights of an Israelite um, by joining Israel. You basically start the process for your your lineage, and so essentially, once you join, then any generations you have after that um, 
are consecutive in the line. And once you get to the third generation, after the third generation, that's when they become fully Israelite. That's mentioned in the Dead Sea Scrolls, as well as in our copies of the Law of Moses, where it, it basically just says that, um, for example, the, the sins of the fathers are visited to the third and fourth generation. Um, and it talks about how if an, if an Egyptian wants to become an Israelite, he must not enter the congregation for three genera generations, it says. And what that, all that means, a generation is your, your next in line. So all your children is your first generation from you. All your grandchildren are, is your second generation from you. And all your great-grandchildren is your third generation from you. So according to the standard of the Torah, your great-grandchildren are allowed, are, are considered full Israelites. If you convert and then you have children, and they have children, and they have children, your great-grandchildren become Israelites fully, without distinction. But you, your kids, and your grandkids are not full Israelites. They're, they're, you're like half Israelites in the sense of, um, it basically equates it with, um, in the Temple Scroll, it equates it with women and children because women did not have the same um, a worship ability in the temple area. They were not allowed to enter the first courtyard um, or the, I think not even the second courtyard. This is mentioned in the, in the temple scroll, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. There was like a, a courtyard for women and a courtyard for the nations. They could go in those two. But the courtyard right. of the Israelites, that was just for men. Right, and only those of the fourth generation could be yeah. in that courtyard. True. Um, so, with all that said, I believe many people in, in the movement who believe they're Israelites and who believe they're part of the covenant, I actually don't think they are, because I think you have to actually physically join a covenant, uh, a, a people group. Um, but in regards to the New Covenant, what do I believe the New Covenant is? I believe, based on some of these apocryphal documents of the Ethiopian church, that uh, the Messiah was a prophet like Moses. And what did Moses do? Moses gave a law, books of law, and revealed the laws of Yah to us. And in the same way, the apostles received in books, in writings, uh, laws from the Messiah. And, and these laws are basically the new covenant. And these laws kind of um, repeat a lot of the old laws, but in a new context. And so from my studies that I've done before, and I've shared with the, this with you guys a little bit, a little bit before, but I have seen evidence that the original Torah, we had the five books, right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. I've seen good evidence that the original Torah was, um, so there was Genesis, then there was Exodus, which ended around chapter uh, 17. There was also Book of Numbers, which had, um, which had like, parts of Exodus, like chapter 35 to 40 type of thing, um, and the book of Numbers. But then there was two books of law, and they paralleled each other. The first book of the law was the law in the context of a moving tabernacle. You know how Exodus talks about building the tabernacle that moves around, and it's not in any one place. The tabernacle moves here, your priests go there and sacrifice in that tabernacle at that place. The tabernacle moves again somewhere else. That's where you go now and, and sacrifice at that place where the tabernacle is now. So the, the original book of Leviticus was the context of the, uh, the law and the context of the moving tabernacle. Then in 
at the end of Moses' life on the mountain when he was about to die, he was revealed the law a second time. But this time, he was told that these laws are in the context of a, a non-moving tabernacle, a temple that stays in one place, and it's always in that same place um, continually. And that is known as the temple scroll. Uh, the temple scroll is, is the law of Moses, the version of Book of Deuteronomy, which specifically gives the entire law, but in the context of temple worship. And when I was comparing the temple scroll with... Uh, Exodus and Leviticus, I noticed something amazing. I noticed that, okay, basically, the order of Deuteronomy is very different than the Temple Scroll. But there's enough evidence that I've shared before that the Temple Scroll is a copy, a very different version, but it is, in fact, a version of the book of Deuteronomy. They're the same exact book, but they're different redactions. They're different manuscript copies. So there's the Temple Scroll, version of Deuteronomy, and then there's the version of Deuteronomy we're familiar with. But one of the key differences is that the Temple Scroll has the same passages from Deuteronomy, but in a very different order. Many of the chapters are just flipped around in different places. But when you look at the order of the laws in the Temple Scroll, the order matches very closely to the order of the laws in the book of Exodus and Leviticus put together. So when you put Exodus, uh, the laws for how to build the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant, and after that you put Leviticus, the order of the laws, the flow and, and the content, chronology of each type of law, it's almost the same exact um, order of laws in the temple scroll that is a strong uh endorsement of the temple scroll version and because of that it leads me to conclude that the original version of leviticus had those laws from exodus exodus chapter 25 to 34 was originally part of the book of leviticus i believe and um and that that original version of the law of Moses for uh, Leviticus was in the context of a moving tabernacle. Um, and supporting this, uh, Book of Deuteronomy, the name Deuteronomy is it's called that because it, it literally means in the Greek, it's a Greek word, and it means deutero, which is second. That's the Greek word for second. And then nomi is the Greek word for law. So it's Book of Second Law. When you go to the Book of Jubilees, Yahweh is speaking to Moses and he tells Moses, he says, I have revealed to you already in the first book of the law. So we have Deuteronomy, the second book of the law, right? If there's a second book of the law, it implies there's a first. Where's the first? Jubilees tells us about a first, but where is it? Well, I believe the answer is Leviticus and it's a, just like Deuteronomy had an original Deuteronomy and the Temple Scroll is the original Deuteronomy, in the same way, there was an original book of Leviticus. And this book of Leviticus was the book of the first law. Um, so there, there's some cool stuff with that, but that's a very deep topic. But the reason I say all that is because it's the same laws, but two different copies. Why? Because the, the, the context of the worship is different. In, in one context, it's a moving tabernacle. So the laws have to be adjusted for a moving tabernacle. But when you're worshiping in a, in a tabernacle that stays put and is a temple and not a moving tabernacle, then the laws have to be changed and adjusted to reflect the fact that the temple is stationary. In the same way, the new covenant is giving the same laws, but in a new context. And that new context is in the context of the church, where you have the Messiah's atonement, you have baptism, and you have um, 
you have various different things that the Messiah introduced into the worship. And one of the key elements that's different is that he introduced a new priesthood in the order of Melchizedek, a new priesthood. And the, these priests we know as bishops, presbyters, and the deacons correspond to the Levites from the Old Testament, from the Old Covenant. And this is taught about in the Apocrypha books of the Ethiopian Bible. They are still considered scriptures to this day by the Ethiopian church. So, um, and in some of these books, it gives the laws of the new covenant. And these laws correspond very well with the Old Testament laws. There's some differences, but in many ways, it's the same type of laws. The laws of uncleanliness, uh, the laws of cleanliness, like food laws, kosher laws, uh, and purification laws, they're repeated in these writings of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. It says it's a sin to eat unclean animals and that it's a sin to not purify yourself according to the law. This is in the New, the new Covenant. Also in the New Covenant is the command to keep the Sabbath day holy by not doing work on it. But it doesn't tell us what work is. So maybe the Essenes kept Sabbath a little bit too strictly, possibly, right? The Pharisees as well. Um, so it's possible that under the new covenant, maybe the Sabbath does not need to be kept as strictly. That's one way to look at it. But the fact is we are still supposed to keep the Sabbath in the new covenant. If you are, if you believe you are part of the new covenant, that according to these extra books of that claim to be written by the apostles, the new covenant requires the Sabbath for people who are baptized into the church. Um, I know that's kind of a long-winded thing that I've said here, but I wanted to answer the question, Jackson, about my yeah, view on the new, okay. new covenant. You did a good job. All right, now I'll accept the tithe from everybody. Well, we haven't taken an offering <laughs> ever, have we? No. Uh, you think that'd be a good idea? Start taking one up? Well, certainly not on the Sabbath, right? No, of course not. Um, but uh, basically, I view covenant as very important. So for me, in my own individual faith, I'm not going to say what anyone else has to do for their own spiritual journey. And I may be in the wrong for this, for myself. But for myself, I believe that I... And not yet ready to join the new covenant. And because it, joining the covenant is a serious thing. So I don't believe that simply believing in the Messiah makes you part of the new covenant. I believe you have to join physically a church. So I'm not ready to physically join a church. A because church. of that, yeah, a, a, a community. Like, like you know, the, oh, the Essenes. Oh, a community. All right. Yeah. Like a um, well, I, I believe the Oriental Orthodox are are much holier. Um, the, the Ethiopian, for example, the Coptics. Um, I would join the Ethiopian Orthodox if there was any around here. The problem is that there's so few congregations. So, yeah. Um, so I'm kind of conflicted because I want to join, but I don't want to join a church that's not keeping the law properly, and unfortunately that's every church, so I'm kind of stuck and conflicted about it, mm -hmm. about, I will eventually join the church, but I'm kind of in a place right now for myself that I feel like, you know how uh, Peter, I think it's in First Peter, he talks about how, or maybe it's Second Peter, um, how if you, it's better not to come to the faith than to come to it and then fall away type of thing. So I view it in the sense of covenant. Covenant is a very serious thing. You don't want to say you don't want to say you agree to the covenant unless you are sold out to do that. You will obey that covenant because if you yeah. if you say you'll obey it and then you don't obey it, you're putting more condemnation on yourself and you're making you're making the covenant look bad when you desecrate it. So for me, I know that I'm not ready yet to fully commit. I'm just being honest here uh, with, with you guys. 
and that's something I need to work on spiritually. I need to, I need to better myself and get and ready myself so I can uh, commit to that. But I'm scared to do that, so I'm I've been putting it off. But um, so I personally do not believe I'm part of the new covenant yet. Uh, but that's something I want to be a part of eventually. You know, uh, a Bishop Gash says that the church that he joined keeps the entirety of the Torah. Oh, yeah? They have, yeah, they, plus they also keep the early Christian liturgies. Hmm. Yeah, see, he had an opportunity to become a bishop in this, well, it's a small denomination. I think it's got about 100 churches. And he says that they've got a Torah keeper's section in there. And so he said, I'm not disobeying the Torah. I am keeping it in the church. I have a question for you, just out of the blue. The, the Ethiopian Clement, is that the same as the Kitab al-Magal? Kitab al-Magal? Is that the rolls of Clement? Yes, the rolls. Okay, so basically, Ethiopian Clement is eight, no, seven sections. Mm -hmm. The one you're talking about, that's the first section. So I, I accept that as scripture, but I accept it as that, that portion is corrupt. It seems okay. pretty corrupt, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so also the Ethiopian version, okay, like I said, there's seven sections. Yeah. The first two sections correspond with an Arabic version. The Arabic uh, version... Yes, that's the Arabic version that I was speaking of, this kitab. Yes, there's an Ethiopian version of the exact same t yeah. portions. And it has the same, it has a lot of the same issues uh, with questionable passages. But it's only the first two sections. And then, um, then there's a whole bunch of stuff that's not in the Arabic version at all, but it is in the Ethiopian version. Well, and the Arabic version just kind of goes crazy with I guess what I'd call it paganism uh, after a while. I thought when I started working on that, I thought, Here, here's, a, here's an uh, official Clement manuscript that nobody knows about. And as I got down, it's a very long manuscript. As I got down to about the middle of it, I just figured there, there are so many Gnostic pagan ideas in this book that I don't think that it could be authentic from Clement. You think that uh, it was authentic, but it only it just got messed up in the process. Yeah, I, I think um, I think some of its ideas are I actually believe are authentic, but some of the other stuff I find issue with. Um, one of the big issues I find with it is that it teaches the sons of Seth theory. Yeah. Um, so I believe the scribes of that book did not like the, the angel doctrine and they actively censored the, an, the angel view from this book of Clement and they changed it to say Sons of Seth. Um, so that's one thing they did that, that changed it. They also altered it to make it agree with the Septuagint chronology, I believe. Because um, I don't believe the chrono Septuagint chronology is correct. And I think that they altered the Septuagint, uh, excuse me, they altered this book of Clement to agree with the Septuagint chronology. Um, and then another thing is they altered it in some places to make it agree with uh, traditional um, church doctrine. Okay. So um, I think. But sometimes I think that the Arabic preserves authentic passages that the Ethiopian does not. And so um, I think the best way to restore that text is to look at both the Arabic and Ethiopian, compare them, and then like reconstruct it. And then, um, then there's a whole bunch. Basically, I would say that's the first half. The first half is the questionable stuff that the Arabic has. The second 
half of this Ethiopian Clement is completely unparalleled. There's nothing in the Arabic version of, about it. It includes the traditional Apocalypse of Peter, you know, the, the Apocalypse of Peter we're all familiar with. And it includes a whole nother section of something that's never been translated into English before. And it gives a list of amazing laws corroborated in the Torah. It specifically says in this section of the Ethiopian Clement, it says that it's a sin to eat unclean animals. It's a sin to uh, not purify yourself. It actually says that if you're menstruating, you're not allowed to go to church because the church is a temple. And just like a woman in the old covenant could not go into the temple when they're menstruating, in the same way, under the new covenant, the church is a temple. And therefore, if you're unclean by an emission of your body, you cannot enter the, the church building. Um, so the church building was actually considered a temple in these apocryphal writings and so it, talk, it talks about like i said the menstruating woman cannot enter it's it says if, if a man and woman have sex they become unclean they cannot go to church until they are purified according to the torah that's one day so they have to be purified after the one day of purification it talks about the uh 40 days if it's a male son and 80 days if it's a female child um and it basically says after a woman gives birth she's unclean for 40 days if it's a male and can't enter the church for 40 days if it's a female it's 80 days and she can't enter the church for 80 days and it talks about all the state of purification you have to be pure and clean to enter a church building um that is strikingly torah type of concepts the idea of you have to be pure for uncleanness to be in a holy place. Um, aren't we the temple? So the Essenes and the Dead Sea Scrolls use the same language of saying that as believers, we are, we are, the te we are a temple, but there's multiple temples. Just like I said that there's the tabernacle, there's the regular temple, then we are a temple of, of, of believers, but then there's also the church buildings, which according to these books, if you believe they're authentic, which I do, they teach that the churches are to be built. Like when you're building churches, it gives laws like uh, of build it. Like for example, the temple scroll says, build the temple, um, build the temple, according to these cubits. In the same way, some of these do documents say, of the Apocrypha, of the apostles say, when you build a church, make sure you build it this number of cubits, da -da 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 -da, in a way that's very similar to uh, Old Testament type of thinking. So there, there's some cool stuff in these uh, New Testament Apocrypha stuff. Some of it might be a little bit corrupted, oh, yeah. uh, by Catholicism type, later Catholicism, but I think a lot of Catholicism actually originates from a perversion of these extra doctrines, these extra teachings of the new covenant that the apostles give us. Um, okay, so there's a passage. Uh, Melissa says, our righteousness is as filthy rags. Um, and I, so that's an interesting passage because I actually think that passage is mis, uh, misused by people. Me so too. if you look, let's look at where that passage is from. That passage, um, I'm going to look it up at Bible Gateway right now. So filthy rags. I'm not sure if it comes up in the New King James. Oh, yeah, New King James Version. So Isaiah 64, verse 6. All right, so it starts saying, um, let's see here. Okay, you are, all right, you meet, you meet him who rejoices and does righteousness, who remembers you in your ways. 
you are indeed angry, for we have sinned. In these ways, we continue, and we need to be saved. But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our, our righteousness are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. Okay? Um, so, what he's talking about there, Israel at that time, when Isaiah is prophesying, Israel was very corrupt. They were very wicked. There was barely anyone righteous in the nation of Israel at that time. Earlier in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah himself identifies himself as someone unclean. A man of unclean lips, I think he said. Uh, when the fire comes down on his tongue or whatever that story was. So, when it says our righteousness is as filthy rags, that was Isaiah talking about Israel. He was not saying our righteousness in the sense of every person who reads this book of Isaiah, it's talking about them. Um, just like there's certain parts of the Bible where it's like, for example, Paul wrote letters to people. Some of the things that Paul wrote in his letters do not apply to everybody. Right. Like, like what, when he said, um, like, uh, th this, this one, uh, let's see, um, bring, let's see. Okay. Second Timothy four thirteen. This is Paul writing to Timothy. Now scholars don't ex believe this is actually authentic. Uh, some scholars don't believe it's authentic. I believe it's authentic, but you know, there's people disagree on this. But um, so he, if this is from Paul, Paul's writing to um, Timothy, and he says in verse 13, bring the cloak or, you know, the garment, the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas when you come. And the books, especially the parchments, he says, he's, he's telling Timothy, remember, bring that garment that I, for, uh, that I left with so-and-so. And when you come, please bring those books as well that we talked about. What books is he talking about? Maybe he means the scriptures. And he says, especially the parchments. What does he mean by that? Um, are, so that makes it sound like some of the books are not parchments. So is he saying bring copies of scripture or some other books? We don't know. But the reason I bring that passage up is when Paul wrote that, he did not intend it for whoever reads this to say, oh, the Bible says I got to get my cloak. All right, I'm going to get my cloak over here. And then uh, I got to bring my books. Whenever, whenever, I've, whenever I visit someone with the name of Timothy, I got to bring my books over to his house. By the way, that word in greek doesn't mean either uh one or the other or codex or anything it's unspecified hmm. as to what that graphy is oh the scriptures yeah the the, 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 the books it's unspecified as to what form they come in sorry to interrupt but i thought i might forget that I just no wanted... yeah okay so um so all that to say I think there's some very solid evidence that you cannot take that verse of Isaiah and apply it to all everybody because if you do that, you come with some some contradictions of scripture. Because according to scripture, after you repent and become uh, and join the faith and are a, a faithful believer, you no longer are unrighteous. You become righteous. You are no longer filthy. You become clean. And you are living a holy life now. You used to be, you, let's say, someone who someone is a former homosexual or a former fornicator. When you repent, you don't live in those things anymore. You don't do those sins anymore. So I just say that because I don't want people to think that when Isaiah said that verse, that he meant that there's no point of even trying to be righteous because all our righteousness is filthy rags. Because Isaiah's point was that 
Israel was trying to be righteous at the time. They were so corrupt. Their righteousness was um, unacceptable in the eyes of Yah. Another passage similar is, your ways are not my ways. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. People say that means that we cannot understand God's reasons. We cannot understand why he requires certain things or why he says things are certain things. But I don't think that's what it's saying. I think, again, um, when, when Yah said that to, uh, in the scripture, he was speaking it to a particular audience that he was condemning. If you are a true believer and you are faithful and righteous, your thoughts are Yahweh's thoughts. Your ways are Yahweh's ways because you are emulating his thoughts and you are emulating his ways. You no longer live by your own selfish thoughts and selfish ways. You are now living by a universal, you're living to serve other others. And serving others is the way of Yah. So uh, your ways, when, when it says your ways are not my ways, your thoughts are not my thoughts, it's not saying you're humans. You, you, you don't know what I, my way is. You'll never know what my way is. You'll never know what my thoughts are because you guys are humans. So don't even try to understand it. Just accept it by faith. That's not what it's saying. What it's saying is you guys are being so sinful. You are having sinful thoughts and you are having sinful ways. And I am calling you now to repentance. Change those wicked, sinful thoughts you have. Change those wicked, sinful ways you have and emulate me. Be holy as I am holy. Uh, stop sinning, obey my laws, and change your thoughts to my righteous thoughts. Stop thinking unrighteous thoughts and start thinking righteous thoughts. Those are my thoughts. Stop going in unrighteous ways. Go in righteous ways because that's my way. And it's my way or the highway. So, yeah. um, so I think that's the meaning of But like I said, people take the verse out of context and they're saying, oh, that means we're just humans. We can never comprehend God's, uh, what God wants, and we just have to accept it by faith. But that's not what the passage means at all, in my opinion, my belief. So, anyways. That was uh, you quite know, a gurgustium on your behalf. I know. Yeah. I'm getting inspired here. Okay. I feel a, I feel a, a wind coming in. Is it, That might be the spirit. We see a tongue of fire on your head. I'm just joking, of course. I don't actually feel a spirit. Just wanted to clarify. Um, but there is something to say about um, like feeling inspired. Like when, like sometimes when I'm when I'm sharing something, like you know, I I say I'm I'm talking very slowly and like you know. I, I say my beliefs on a subject, but but when there's certain topics coming, it just starts flowing to me, and it's like um, like it, a more a more passionate. Cause it starts becoming like almost like automatic, and it like it just like comes together. I don't believe that's necessarily uh, the spirit, but I believe that it is a type of inspiration that you just become filled with this passion. For the topic you're talking about and it just auto it, your brain the way your our brains work it takes this information that we're trying to share and then it, it just magically combines it just like a computer combines it in the way the, the, a perfect way like almost like a um, art, art like you know how symmetry happens when it's like a perfect perfect symmetry it just beautifully lines up when you're trying to say something i experience that sometimes but well, we found when we went through our study on the evidences of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, one thing we found in just about every passage in Acts is one of the initial evidences, and probably the strongest one, is zeal. Zeal, uh, feeling excited about it, feeling ready to prophesy. Uh, I call it sometimes going on a roll, but being being spiritually fueled for prophetic speaking. And that's what you're displaying tonight, zeal. And I was reading something a few weeks ago. Um, 
So the ancients believed the poets, like the Greek poets, were inspired in a similar way. And um, what's actually cool is that, like, there's there are some secular songs like of unbelievers, but some of their lyrics are just so powerful and so moving, and it's like perfect, yeah, perfect words that just come together, and. So I think there may be something to like inspiration, like for song artists as well, like even unbelievers, just, just like the ancient poets ha may have had some type of zeal for their poetry. I think the music artists have that same type of zeal sometimes. 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 Sometimes they have the opposite direction. Right. You ready have, for a question? Yeah. Or you want to keep on? No. Another question. What? Um, let me see. I'm trying to decide which one to do here. I got a whole lot of questions this last set, couple of weeks. Uh, well, one he, Oh, how were the Germanic people converted to Christianity? Was it full exclusiveness or was it more inclusive or something else? How were they converted to Christianity? You want me to start? I don't know enough of, of their history, right. so I don't really have an answer. Um, but okay. you can uh, share your. I, I do have one thing to say on that. I'll just say that there there are historical documents which do record the history of the Germanic people. Like I think I think Bede, uh, a, a church writer from, from Tacitus. Like, Tacitus does. Okay, well, he has a I, book I, called Germania. That's well, I, I, I know that a later writer, like around the 800 AD, mm -hmm. named Bede, wrote about the Germanic people or specifically the English. But, um, but I will say, um, I don't know much more about that. So, is that uh, like the, the Bede the Blessed? He would have been around. B, B E D E, yeah. and he wrote he wrote in Latin and English. Okay. Uh, but Jackson, I don't know more about the subject, so why don't you share right. your view sure. on the Germanic? Well, I can tell you because I've done quite a bit of studies in that direction. When you study the ancient empires, it is so so interesting. So, tenth uh, century, uh, a Frank named Charles known as Charles the Great or Charlemagne, was converted to Arian Christianity. And he decided when he was converted that everybody on the continent ought to be an Arian Christian. And he began to evangelize by force. He finally went from Gaul or France or actually Franconia and moved east little by little and in, in the course of his life he had conquered just about all of mainland europe including all the germanies and he had had them converted to aryan christianity which was at that time considered heretical by the roman church so there was quite a bit of interplay there between the roman pope and charlemagne and so that's the way they were converted until finally, you know, the Catholics got a hold of those Germans a couple of hundred years later. And that's where they went from there. So that's how the Germans were converted. Charlemagne was very Christian, very strict, very warlike, and very rich. And I know the Goths uh, converted early on. They, they yeah. had uh, the, the New Testament and some of the Old Testament uh, right. translated into their language. Okay. Did the Edomites live in Petra? That's another one I don't know about. So, you know, yes. that's, your, that's your forte, Jack. The answer is yes. Petra, you, you know, is the stone city. Did you read what I said, Jackson, in the comment? No, let me look. 
he said something nasty about me again? No, just uh, when you were talking about your answer, one of the phrases you said was just about all. Yeah. And and you, you said it. About all. Like sometimes like language is funny. Like we don't we don't always pronounce every letter fully. We like we might do a very soft pronunciation. Like with a T, you can do like a hard T sound. Or you could do a more like like it's very faint, you can barely hear it. Mm -hmm. So anyways, it's just kind of funny because I always think about I always think about Baal. So I I hear it sometimes even well, you know people... see they say talk about the prophets of baal or baal as they say in the baptist church in uh, the life of elijah is that elijah and you know we get this idea all these prophets of baal and they were in competition with the uh, prophets of yahweh but as far as the word baal it just means Lord. Lord, it means our Lord. Master. They capitalize it, then they've got a God named Lord, but actually the, the Baals wasn't one God, but many. These were the gods that Abraham's father made and sold. I don't know if you know the story about that. But uh, Abraham went to his father's store and destroyed them all after he had had some kind of a contact with Elohim. He destroyed them, and the king of that place down in Ur, I think, oh, maybe he was up there in Nahor by then. His father got really mad about that and went to the king about it, and so. One of the reasons Avraham went on his journeys is because the law was after him for destroying his father's shop. There's a great story about that. You ought to look it up sometime. How he made out that these gods were fighting over a bowl of porridge. <laughs> and when his father came back and witnessed all this carnage, all these gods broken to pieces, uh, Abraham said something like, it's a little foggy now, it's in the book of Jasher and some other ones, said that um, they were fighting over porridge. And, you know, they were alive. Your gods are alive, but now they all are dead because they've killed each other. So that's what sent Abraham off from Ur to Nahor and then down there on his trip. To bear Shiva. There's different accounts of Abraham. Several Some different. of them are more reliable than others. I think Jubilee's account I trust the most, and then Apocalypse of Abraham comes next. Jasher yeah. I trust the least. Yeah. So here's one that you ought to be able to answer quite handily, whether you know about it or not. This comes from Liv Nas. What was it about Cleopatra that made her so desirable? She was a woman. That's exactly right. She was a seductress. She seduced her, her brother. He, she seduced Mark Anthony, the general. She seduced uh, Julius Caesar, Caesar and had a baby with him. And everybody that saw her was just completely enamored, not so much with her beauty. There, there are some portraits of her that have come over. She's not that beautiful, but she has this certain kind of sexual allure, uh, seducing kind of spirit that men just couldn't leave their hands off of her. And so is written in the stories of that time. Did we scare Sherry away? Probably. You're you're falling down on the job here, brother. Why did Paul choose Timothy as his replacement? Um did he? Does it say? Does it say he did? 
Uh, I don't. I don't know. Mark Bloomers thinks so. <laughs> well, because remember, Paul, where was he in Ephesus, and he left Timothy someplace to take over his work in the congregation. Mm -hmm. It's uh, in. I don't know First Timothy, and he talks about how the church is supposed to be set up and what an elder is supposed to do and what a deacon is supposed to do and what a woman is supposed to do. So I'm supposing that he set Timothy up as the uh, deacon of that congregation, the pastor of the congregation, and undoubtedly he did it because Timothy was his understudy. I did want to say one thing that you just reminded me of. Um, what I was talking about earlier with the New Covenant, um, Paul gives a lot of laws that are not in the Law of Moses, and they're not in any other writings of the Apostles in the regular New Testament. So we have a couple options here. One, Paul's just making up laws that he has no authority to do. Two, um, Paul, some, for some strange reason, he's being given the authority to introduce new laws. Three, um, three would be that uh, these laws were given um, elsewhere by the apostles, but that the apostles' writings did not survive in the regular Bible, and so it appears that Paul's the only one who talks about it, even though originally all the apostles talked about it. And there's, there might be a few other possibilities, but of those possibilities that I just mentioned, the one I, the last one makes more sense in the context of the apocryphal books being true, the New Testament apocryphal books, because a lot of these laws, these same laws are mentioned in the, uh, the apostolic apocrypha books of the Ethiopian Bible. Um, so the laws that I'm speaking of would be bishop, um, yeah. a, uh, presbyters and deacons and, 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 and different Irma. things like that. Um, and then one of the strangest laws, when I say strange, I mean, where did Paul come with this idea? One of the strange ones is do not let a widow be a, accepted as a widow um, if she's younger than 60 years old. Right. <laughs> That's a very bizarre that law. Is. is Paul making up this law or did he get it from somewhere? Well, what's interesting is the Dead Sea Scrolls, it doesn't say that about widows, but what it does say is it gives different like age brackets in a similar kind of way. It says like, a bishop is to be, not a bishop, uh, overseer is to be um, this age. Yeah, 30. Um, elders are to be 25. It says 30 to, 30 to 50 for uh, overseers. Elders, 25 to 60. And then you're kicked out after 50. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, then there's uh, the war scroll, which gives different age brackets for when you're to fight in war and things like that. Uh, and the de Dead Sea Scrolls, um, oh yeah, sorry. Is it from the Talmud? No, it's not from the Talmud. So basically there's, um, it's from the uh, Ethiopian Bible of the apostles actually has the same law. It's, it's in the Apostolic Constitutions. The Ethiopian Bible calls it Didascalia. So in Didascalia, it actually gives this law of widows needing to be 60 years old. So first, um, the part in, I'm going to read the verse, tell you guys which verse it is in the New Testament, so you know I'm not making it up. Well, while you're looking at that, in Roman law in those days, you were not permitted to be a widow for more than six months to two years. You had to get reconnected for the purpose of having more children. That's the Lex Juliana in the Roman canon. 
Is so, First Timothy 5, 9. Do not let a widow under 60 years old be taken into the number. Uh, and then they add in italics, and not unless she has been the wife of one man. Um, so uh, it's a weird law, right? It's, it doesn't make, yeah. it seems strange, but either Paul's making up this weird law and therefore it's not valid, or the apostles taught this law, and it is valid. Um, you know, so those are the uh, two possibilities. Um, I don't believe the Egyptians added these things. I believe these weird laws of the New Testament originate from the apostles' commandments of these extra books. Um, I'm going to look up that one passage um, of the uh, widow thing from the apostolic constitutions. I'll, I'll read it to you guys. Um, so you have the parallel for that law. Uh, I don't, I th as we're, we're getting close to the 1030, so we might not really have time for any more questions um, after this. So may I speak to that? The widowhood. Sure. Well, I'm 56 years old, and I'm a widow. So, um, I'm curious where that leaves me. So, with your narrative, I mean, I just want to know what, where that leaves me. That's all. Right. So basically. It's, it's, it sounds strange to people, but it's not saying that, oh, you're not a widow. That's not what it's saying. Because obviously you're a widow. You know, you are, right. you are, you are what you are. But right, right, right. what it is saying is that there's a certain uh, church-supported group of widows. And so if Up you... Up to the age of 60. If you're if you're less than sixty years old, you're not part of the this group. If you're it, less it, than sixty, you're not yes. part of this group. Okay. Right. Well, doesn't he say that uh, true widows, but not gad about widows that just go around gossiping and all that? You know? Yeah. Let me, what let does me, that mean? And and yeah, I mean time, yeah, Jackson. What does that mean? Well, because. Look, I have personally um, been a beneficiary of the third year tithe of the widow. That's great. So, yes, it is. It, it was a beautiful thing. It really was. But my question is, um, does that mean that I was not, I had to use the word worthy. I had to use that word. Um, but does that mean that I was not eligible for that tithe? Well, who gave the tithe? Um, Somebody that believed that the third year tithe of the sabbatical cycle. Um, Doesn't it go for four people as well? It does. I'm not saying that they didn't give a tithe to poor people. No, but wouldn't, would, you, would you fall under that? Like, would you fall under poor as well? Because um, if, if you do, then I it, think it effectively I, doesn't matter, right? If, if you... Well, I don't think it really matters. I think that there is a, a, a third year tithe, um, according to Leviticus, um, to the widow and the fatherless. And a fatherless doesn't mean that you're an orphan. Fatherless means you have no father. It doesn't mean that you have no mother. It means you have no father. And right. right, right. I mean, that's just the way it's stated. 
So, and so, so I received a tithe as a widow, and then I also received a tithe for my minor children who were fatherless. And I don't know any other way than to put it like that. Okay. Well, um, Jackson. Um, that's how I received it. That's how I received it right. from an individual. Was I give you this tithe as you know the mother, you know a widow, and I give you this tithe also to your three children who are fatherless. That now. sounds great. Who is that? It was person? beautiful. It was beautiful. Let, let me just say this, Jackson. It was beautiful, but yeah. we I started know, a little bit later. My, my yeah, go ahead. Is, yeah, we could my go. My about ten is How biblical? What I, I believe it was biblical. Okay, but I want also want to know how biblical was it, <laughs> or did they just think that they could just do something because they just believed? Okay. That something was right. supposed to be, you know, how authentic was it? I guess. Well, then it's question. not. It's I'm not asking. exactly a tithe. What it is is alms. A tithe right. goes to the Levites, to the ministers, uh, not to the other people or the church. But they have given you alms because okay. they are permitted to give you alms. And they saw you, thought you needed some money, and they gave you some money. So what you're saying is then there is no third year tithe. Yes, there is. Here's how to it works. The, to the widow and the father. Okay, here's is that how what you're it saying? works. No, I'll tell you how is it works. Is that what you're saying? Can you hear me? Yes, sir, I can. Okay, no, I'll tell you how it works. Scripture talks about the tithe, 10%. Okay. Then there's the second tithe. You save up money and you go to Feast of Tabernacles. Okay. And so when you get done with the Feast of Tabernacles, you've got a third tithe, which is whatever is left over from the second tithe. Going to Tabernacles, you got money left over from your savings. You, okay. do, you do a mitz, a mitzvot. If mitzvah, right, if right, you, right, right, you can use that money for people, you can use that money really for anything you want, including going out and buying stuff for yourself. So he's taken his third tithe after tabernacle sometime, if he, under, if he understands it correctly, and he's decided to give the gleanings, they call it gleaning, right, right, I know what you, that is, over to you. So what you're saying is then, Jackson, is that there is no third year fatherless widow tithe. That's what you're saying. It was never specifically in, in, for widows and orphans. Say that again, please. Um, it, it was not oh, no, no, please. The, the, the third tithe third year tithe or the third tithe was not for it wasn't commanded to be do this for widows and orphans specifically um, is that what you're saying specifically yeah it, it didn't specifically mention them um it well then can you tell me then where that idea came from yes it I, comes from the torah please I mean, I know it comes from the Torah, but can you tell me? Because if somebody sent me a tithe, you know, 10 years ago for myself as a widow and then my children at that time who were, you know, fatherless, of course, now they're all grown and gone. So Hooray. whatever. So, so. How did I receive that tithe? Okay, so I, I'm actually wrong about this. Okay, so um, so the passage from Deuteronomy 
It's Deuteronomy chapter 14. And it says, at the end of three years, you shall bring forth all the tithe of your produce in that year. And right. Shall lay it up inside your gates. And the Levite, right. because he has no part nor inheritance with you, and the stranger and the orphan and the widow who are and the widow, the, gates, the orphan right? and the wit the fatherless and the widow, yes. Shall come and shall eat and be satisfied that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hand, which you do. Right. And, and there's another passage from Deuteronomy as well. Right. And that is what happened to me. Right. Personally, so personally. There's two there's two ways to take it. One is that So was I right to take it is what I at the time, of course, I took it because I felt that at that time, that I think it you was were right. the right thing to do biblically. But I want to know, this is what I'm asking you, Anaya, and I know I can't go back and undo it. I understand. That. Right, right. But I'm asking you, was I right to take that time? Did you feel like you were in a difficult financial situation? At that time, At I that did, time. yes. So yes. then I think you were, you were right to take it. Um, because the passage says if you're poor, it gives a, a bunch of different things. So if you thought you were, you were allowed to receive it because you were a widow, but you were poor, it doesn't matter if... You not only was well, I didn't look at it as not. I was poor. No, I know, but I'm I'll look it. at it as I was a widow, and my children were fatherless. I didn't look at it as an issue of being poor. Right, but what I'm saying is that if you were in financial there's a difference. difficulty, I mean, there's you know single women who are poor; they right. have no children, and they're right. still poor. Right. So I didn't look at it as an issue that I was poor, but that I was a widow and my children who were in elementary school were fatherless, not orphans, because obviously I'm still alive, right. but they were fatherless. And that is the question that I'm asking. Are you complaining particular. about Particular. <laughs> no, she's trying to understand the- uh... I'm just trying to understand jackson okay to make sure that the tide that was given to me was a legitimate tide i know it was on the person who gave it but was it on me the recipient of it all was i legitimate to take that tide for me as a widow and for my children who were or, or who were fatherless You'd have to decide for yourself based on what, what you see in scripture. Uh, we, we only share our perspective, but obviously you answer to the father. So, uh, but I believe based on your, you had financial difficulty. They, want, they wanted to give it to someone who was in financial need and they helped you. Um, they and did. so, yes. so um, there's two possibilities of what Paul's saying. Either he's saying you're not, uh, widows are not to be helped. Either Paul is interpreting that passage. Paul is possibly interpreting Deuteronomy to say, widows under 60 are not to be helped. That's one interpretation. The second interpretation is that widows can be helped, but you would help them on an individual basis. If someone wants to help a widow, that's their third time. It's up, there. It's up to them. But then there may be a separate thing that's part of the new covenant, and it's not mentioned in the old covenant. So it's possible Paul was introducing something new, which was a specific group for widows, which the community gave like a, a different, like a special uh, thing for. Um, so those are, there's two right. possibilities there. Um, right. I want to read the passages, and then we'll wrap it up. Because well, I'm thinking about the Deuteronomy passages, really, because I don't think for myself, my children are grown and they're in their mid-20s and upper 20s. And so I don't look at my children as fatherless anymore. Right. Although they are, technically. 
Um, and I don't look at myself. I, I see myself definitely as a widow, but I don't uh, look to, you know, gather. Right. So from that look, kind of thing anymore. I would I would not accept it to this yeah. day. If someone was said, well, you know, your kids are in their twenties and you're a widow, and let me give you all this money, I would be like, no, no, right. no, no. Well, for example, That's we have so it, it, it's not the same criteria. Right. So well, in our speak. society, we have social security for people who are in their older years. So in some ways, Social Security kind of takes the place of some of these institutions well, in the law of Moses in some ways. Yeah, um, that's true. I don't consider myself those in the Social Security years. Well, though. you know, no, I'm, I'm not know. saying, I'm not saying that. I know that, but I'm <laughs> saying, and also not only that, but Social Security in our government standpoint is not Yahweh's standpoint. Well, yeah, there's there's a whole issue of it's well, a, that's a different thing about that's social different security issue. is look, you've paid that all your life, you've paid it. I understand. You could that, live Jackson. forever and you'd I, never get it all back. I I know I get that I get that. Yeah, I, I hate get it. some people. Believe me, I do. I do because when my people, children's father people. died, when my children's father died, and he was forty four, he'd only been paying into social security for like you know 35 years and you know i got all this money and everybody's like well you got too much <laughs> and then it's like well there's no such thing there's just no such thing because i know how to do math i mean i'm not a very intelligent woman but i am quite mathematical and I know how to add and subtract and multiply. And so it wasn't difficult for me to understand. I, my question was simply about the third year sabbatical tie. Yep. Period. So, uh, so That's um, all it was about, so, Jackson. Okay. So, so I'm just going to read these two passages and then we'll leave it at that because basically okay. you're. Is this, this about is a, the third year sabbatical? No, this time? is about the widows. Um, the widows. Okay. Yes. So basically, um, you've okay. you've stated your your difficulty with what Paul says compared to what the Torah says. And so, I really don't have a difficulty with what Paul says. I just want to know what the Bible says overall. Okay. Overall. Right. Overall. So I'll read these two passages, and then I okay. think. Okay because we're we've already kind of passed the point we want to end um so after i read these I'm two sorry. no I'm that's sorry. okay i I'm apologize sorry. Um, i apologize I'm, uh, some, no it's, it's fine we, we just yeah, try you're to... in big trouble vicky <laughs> i'm a big deep kimchi i know <laughs> thank you onaya you are so gracious onaya i love you for that so I, so when i read the two passages just uh <laughs> meditate on it in your own private study and then next I will next I time will. We, we come back we could we could talk about it more if we want I've to. got my pen and paper ready to write it down all right so this is first Timothy 5 chapter 5 okay and you could just read the whole chapter really but um not the whole chapter is not about widows but a good chunk of it is so you know for full context it doesn't hurt to read the whole chapter um so it starts with verse 3 it says Honor, honor widows who are really widows. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show piety at home and to repay their parents. And for this, for this is good and acceptable before God. I'll just stop there and say, it sounds like what he's saying in his opinion, that if a widow has children who can take care of her, then the children should be the ones who are doing the financial taking care of it shouldn't be put on the rest of the community because that would be a burden to the community to take right. care of her when she has children who can take care of her. Right. I um, get that. And their parents also. Right. And then she now, might have parents who can take care of her. Right. right. Yeah. Paul right. doesn't mention right. the parents, but you're right. That's true. Uh, now she who is really a widow and left alone. So she's left alone. She doesn't have anyone to take care of her. Right. 
trusts in God, so she has to be a uh, part of the faith, continues in supplications and prayers night and day. So she's faithful. But she who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. And these things command that they may be blameless. But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he is denied the faith and is worse than unbeliever. So in other words, if, 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 if here I, I'm 56 years old. My parents both are still living. They can't provide for me financially, but also have children who are in their mid-20s. So what that's saying is if if you need my, help, my children are, are not willing to help me, and my parents are not willing to help me. Not willing to help me. That's what that's talking about, right? Right, correct. Right. Okay. And then it, and then it goes on and says, then he says, do not let a widow under 60 years old be taken into the number. What does he mean by taken into the number? It means taken into the care of the church where the church is basically providing everything they need the arms yeah um right. it says she must have been the wife of one man so in other words shame on me if my children who are out here making a living and my parents who have plenty of money to support me and, or, or at least help support me and my children who are out here working and none of, neither of them agree to help me out, not pay everything necessarily, but help me out. That's what that means, right? Right. I don't think okay. that you're the okay. one. I think that they, they're the ones that are going to have to deal with it when it comes to the judgment. Well, we're not talking about the judgment, though, right now, though, Jackson. We're just talking about me as a widow. Well, so the, the guy who gave it to you, he, um, he wasn't really giving it in the, in the context of a church giving it to you. Like, Paul's like talking the alms, here. Like the Catholic alms, you mean? Well, so Paul is talking about specifically a communal a communal focus where it's giving it to the tithes. You see, um, as an individual, we can give our money to whoever we want. Tomorrow, I could just right. say to you, I could say to you, I have a million dollars. I'm a millionaire. I'm going to give you a thousand you a dollars, Vicky. Well, I was going to say a million dollars. I was going to give you a million dollars. But well, uh, thanks, but I'm not even that. Chip. You only I'm want a thousand. Either. Well, I mean, I'll take a million if you got it to give. So, if I wanted to give you a million <laughs> tomorrow, that would be nothing wrong with that. That's a gift. That There's is. nothing wrong with that, right? So the but guy who gave it, it to you, it was a gift. Right. And so, but that doesn't negate. On an individual basis, someone can on give On an a individual gift. basis. But on a church right. basis, right. you are not to be given the money, the church's money uh, for as a widow. Under what Paul? In other saying. words, if the church, in other words, if I'm a member of a church with ten people, say for example ten, because that's an easy number to deal with. I'm not. They are not obligated to support me just because I'm a widow. Is that what you're saying? Right. Okay. And I understand that, and I get that, and I agree with that. But once you're sixty. And if you don't have anyone to take care of you, then the church, it is the church's duty. You don't have anyone. You're all by yourself. The church. Okay, so I'm 56. So if I'm a member of a, of, a, of a congregation, 10 people, and I'm 56, which is what I am, and they're not obligated, doesn't mean they can't help me. It just means that they're not obligated to help me. So for the next four years, I might struggle, right. which I'm going to do anyway, right? Because I'm 56 and a widow and whatever. But the congregation I'm a member of for that next four years 
after that, then are you saying that they are obligate? Not are they obligated? So the way I to would help say me, it, or are they just generous within their heart to help me out? What are you so, saying? So what I would say is that at any time they are able to help you with not the church's funds, but their own funds. So there's their, their own money and the church's money. So when it's their money, right. they can, they can help you anytime. When right. it's the church's money, they can. So have. my neighbor can bring me bread. if She wants to bring me bread. Yes. But, okay. but, um, the church cannot bring you bread as a widow. Um, cause I don't qualify. Yet. Right. So you can't take the church's funds, the money from the church. So they're not to allowed you. to, even if they want to, they're not allowed. To. Right. But once you're 60, okay. Okay. then they evaluate your situation and they see, do you have anyone okay. else to take care of you? If you don't have anyone else to take care of you, you're a widow, you need help. You have you, the church is going to help. You. It depends on. The so in other words, my children are responsible to take care of me in that type of situation right. until I am 60. Uh, no, I think it's saying you're, the children are required to take care of you even uh, beyond 60. Well, yeah, um, but as far as it, they're saying like, okay, mom, I'll bring you some bread until you're 60, and after you're 60, then the church will take care of you. I think what it's saying is that before you're 60, is that it? you still have the ability to procure, like you still have the ability to get married, for example, when you're younger than 60. Oh, um, God, don't I wish. <laughs> <laughs> um, things like that. So there's still ability to find ways to take care of yourself. But once you're 60, oh, under the, under the okay. Torah, you become an old under person. The Torah. You, hey, become, Vicky, you become old. When you're only 60. is. So you mean I'm I've only got four years until I'm considered old? According to Torah. What were you gonna say, Jackson? I said Vicky. That was a that was single. such a smooth send off. Oh Naya. And you know that was uh, so smooth. What were you saying, Jackson? I said that <laughs> I love it, oh Naya. I love you for that. Up. I'll go hook fix you up with Commander Lee. I don't know who any. I'm pretty sure I don't want to be hooked up with anybody <laughs> named Commander. <laughs> All right. So, I, I hopefully what I said. So um, th that makes sense. Totally yeah. makes sense, Anaya. Totally. So now, so now I'm going to read the rest of it, and then we won't we won't discuss it because, like we said, we're out of time. Um, so I'm going to read the rest. Okay. Thank you so we, much for your we, attention. We could talk more about it on Facebook after this, though. You know, and. and I message. would love to. I really would. Because I'd like to know my position. So the rest of the passage is, uh, so I'll read that verse again. Do not let a widow under 60 years old be taken into the number. She must be a, the wife of one man, well reported for good works. If she has brought up children, if she has lodged strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she has relieved the afflicted, if she has diligently followed every good work. But refuse younger widows... For when they have begun to grow wanton against, against Christ, they desire to marry, having condemnation because they have cast off their first faith. And besides, they learn idleness, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but also gossips and busybodies, saying things which they ought not. Therefore, I desire that younger ones marry, their children manage the house, Give no opportunity to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some have already turned aside after Satan. If any believing man or woman has widows, let them relieve them, and do not let the church be burdened, that it may relieve those right. who are really widows. So that's what Paul Ooh. says, and the passage from Apostolic Constitutions, which I believe that's where Paul gets his strange rule from, this is from the Apostolic Constitutions. The Greek version. And you think that's strange? Well, I'm saying strange in a, in a otherwise strange because it see, it's something foreign, like 
you don't see that anywhere else in the New Testament, that type of language. So it's, oh, it, okay. it, it appears okay. weird right. compa compared to right. the rest of the Right, you're right, you're right, you're right. I see where you're coming from. So here's what the Apostolic Constitution says, claims to be written by the apostles, claims to be the law of, of the Messiah in the New Covenant. Choose your widows not under 60 years of age, that in some measure the suspicion of a second marriage may be prevented by their age. But if you admit one younger into the order of widows and she cannot bear her widowhood in her youth and marries, she will procure indecent reflections on the glory of the order of the widows and shall give an account to God, not because she married a second time, but because she has grown wanton against Christ and did not keep and, and not kept her promise because she did not come and keep her promise with faith and the fear of God. Wherefore, mm. such a promise ought mm. not to be rashly made, but with great caution, for it is better for her not to vow than to vow and not to pay. But if any younger woman who has lived but a while with her husband and has lost him by death or some other occasion and remains by herself, having the gift of widowhood, she will be found to be blessed and to be like the widow of Sarepta, uh, blah, blah, blah. The, the rest of the passage uh, it just quotes. So something. in other words, as long as you like, are not like going, I'm a widow, I'm a widow, I'm a widow. Somebody take care of me. Um, then that means that you are just not like, you're covered. It's, it sounds like what you what the passage according to the apostles is that if you receive help from the church, you are telling them that you will not marry again. If you then go and marry someone after receiving help from the church as a widow, then you have broken your vow to the church. If you, if you are not willing to be a widow the rest of your life, then you oh, are so not you to receive you take the church. It, okay. All right. Yeah. That's how and I so, understand. So if you take a if you're a widow and you take a vow from the church and then something happens in the future and you do get married, then you can no longer take that vow from the church. Right. And basically because because a woman's young if, if a woman's younger than sixty, there's still a desire in her heart to get married. And um be, because of that I'm pretty there, sure when I'm 65, I might want to get married. Right. Well, and under the, under the, in the older Even times. Even though I don't right now, I'm just saying. Well, so, what I, in the older times, under these laws, the context, mean? the context of these laws, women typically married to have families. They did not marry for love right. or companionship. Right. So. Um, Which is what I would not do at this time. Right. Right. I've so, had children. I can't have children. So right, I would so, not marry so because if you have children. If a woman's younger, she still has the desire to be fruitful and multiply. Um, so that's why they're not allowed to be... <clears throat> they're talking about younger widows. Right. But when they right. become 60, they no longer have that desire to, ha to enter a marriage for having children. Um, Anyways. Well, I can assure you and I, at the age of 56, having raised three teenagers by myself, I assure you, <laughs> last thing I want is to have a child. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the passage, the passage I was reading from was the third book of Apostolic Constitutions. There's a little bit more of the quote, but you guys can read it on your own time. But I read the main gist of it, and basically... That makes if the, sense. If this book, totally makes sense. If this book is truly by the apostles, then Paul got this stuff about the widows from the apostles, from this new covenant thing. Right. Anyways, that's right. pretty much what we're going to end well, it. Well, thank you so much. You gave me a great deal of enlightenment, oh, no. So thank you. You're welcome. Jackson, uh, want to say anything about anything? No, I just appreciate you who showed up tonight it's always kind of fun and uh, i'm excited about it now it's a really good session i learned some things i didn't have to talk too much 
Uh, I'm going to mention we have a service tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock. I'm preaching on the virtues of communism. Come visit us the same time, same station. And then Sunday night, we've got something really special. You've been wanting to blow off about politics lately? Me? We've got an expert coming in, a political expert that's going to give his ideas and thoughts about the political situation right now and how it relates to faith. And that is Bishop Kevin, Bishop Daryl K. Henry. So that's tomorrow night at eight o'clock, or I, I'm sorry, Sunday night at eight o'clock. Come visit if you can. He's really humorous too. He used to be called Bishop Ragesh. We all need some humor. Mm -hmm. Yes. Come on over. He'll answer all your questions. Well, I want to thank night? you for Sunday night. thank you, Anaya, for you gave me a great deal of insight into my widowhood at the age of fifty-six. And I wanted to say, and thank I'm, you so much, Jackson, Melissa. You were so good thank tonight. You so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Bless your heart. Yeah, you know, I, I do not permit a I do not permit a woman to fight. I'm always good. <laughs> you just sit I you, I just misunderstood I I was cooking, but I was listening to you guys, but he never answered my questions, so maybe next time because my questions are really good. She has great Which questions. one was she that? Really does. Well, What's the deal about baptism for the dead? We'll have to do that next time. But yeah, yeah, maybe, do, yeah we got to do that because we've been looking into that. We that's, said we were, yeah, few, we said a, we were going to study a few, it. A few people out. have talked to me about that. Yeah. Good we're going to talk about it, Melissa. We are. And Jackson, I would really like it if in a few minutes, um, I know it's late for you and stuff and, you know, whatever, yeah, but yeah, I'd really like to speak on. to you personally. Give me 10 minutes. Um, yeah, ten minutes. Yeah, that would be good for me. Ten, okay. fifteen minutes. Let's go. And I really like to get on with you, and um, ask you about some particular things. I think she wants and, to ask um, me on a date. <laughs> Jackson, you just I assure that out. you, I'm I just, coward. I just grilled poor Anaya about, you know, my widowhood, <laughs> and, and you're I'm a widow thinking too. all I'm after is a date. I'm a widow. I'm a widow too. I am, and I assure you, I between like it, the though. two of you, this is well, the old widows and widowers club. I've here. been a widow. I've been a widow for so oh, long. Oh, not. I just, no, he's not. Well, he's a young man. Mm -hmm. Emerson's. So married. I'm just like, no, nah, I'm not looking for a date, Jackson. You're All so right. cute. Neither am I. I got a. You're so a, cute, Jackson. You're so cute. You've got a fiance. I changed my mind. A dog. Moving to well, Tennessee. I've seen a picture. I've seen a picture of her too, she's Jackson. Beautiful. And she is a beautiful, beautiful woman. Yeah. Who? That Laura? I don't know what. Uh, no, no, her name. Laura. No, it, her name is Trelly. She's in the film. Trelly, yes. She's been yeah. beautiful. Oh, his wife. Oh, she's yes. Been in lockdown for ten months in a little tiny room in Manila, a thousand miles away from where she lives. Hi. No air conditioning. Ten months. Finally, she got to go home. She just got home this. To her week. family. To her family. Yeah. She Praise went, Yahweh. You went up to Manila, which I said is like a thousand miles away, to fill out some paperwork to get over here. And no sooner than she did she get there, than they called for the lockdown. The lockdown, right? And so she was stuck there. She couldn't work. Couldn't but do she's right now. She's with her family, right? Not back to her family. Yeah. Praise Yahweh for that. That's Only her beauty. Yes, her family's her beauty. That's her beauty. It's a blessing. She's beautiful. I'm, I'm married. Melissa. I'm the body of Christ. I'm married to Christ. Yeah, you kind of remind me of a nun. Well, that's because really? she's a Mennonite. Yeah, a Mennonite. Okay. Yeah. Where's your yeah. Where's the doily on your head? It's on there, I sure. I don't have my Sunday one on because it's not Sunday. Okay. 
All right. So, well, but she <laughs> does have it. I've seen it. I do have one, though, a Sunday one. Blessings to all of you and all of you, all of you. and Jackson. I've got to go. And so, up and so here. all of you, a good night. Mm -hmm. You too, Hello, oh, night. And thank you so much. You gave me a great deal of insight yes, and some real job. beauty that was in the some word. Good preaching. That was beautiful. Beautiful. Give, word I'm gonna re-listen to it and let and my I kids hear it. it. Oh, you nine. can give me the tithe on Monday. Shalom. These okay. wonderful <laughs> people. Shalom.